And that's the real question. If you actually ask yourself, what has philanthropy actually solved? And it's not a lot. Like think about them. We've put hundreds of millions of dollars into cancer research and solving hunger and disaster relief or climate change. And we don't have real solutions. Private philanthropy works in a couple areas. Uh, vaccines, coronavirus is actually a good example, but malaria, smallpox, like crazy innovative research where private philanthropists can take crazy risk, prove concept, and then let the governments or big end nonprofit organizations who are allowed to take risk see that, see it as a safer bet, and then pour resources into it. Um, but hunger, homelessness, cancer, like those are not places where private philanthropy has really done well. So, and at the risk of making this redundant, why can't private philanthropy solve hunger? Like one of the posts I saw was saying how, you know, I'm going to tell my kids this is why one in three children are hungry right now. Because you have Bezos, instead of paying income taxes, is, you know, flying his penis rocket to space. Like, why is that wrong? There's one, there's treating the symptom and there's treating the cure, like the cause of hunger, right? Um, so you can feed people and we do that, right? Um, there's a lot of philanthropy that's spent like giving food to the hungry. And that is important. It's like a, I call that like disaster relief. There are people in need, we have to help them. And that's what philanthropy should be doing. It's also what our government should be doing. In order to actually solve hunger, we probably should get an answer on this. But the biggest challenge is not, at least in what I've researched, it's not a food quantity issue. It's a distribution issue. It's a government issue. It's a, um, I mean, every government's different. Um, so, so could a, but could a private individual with enough money solve that distribution issue? I mean, if they were able to bribe every single government official to get them to do what they want, like, I don't, like, you know, and maybe Jeff Bezos could create a, a Why don't you tell the World I mean, Bank story? When I was on Wall Street, I, I asked a, a very senior woman from the World Bank, and she, well, she asked all of us, if you had an infinity money, what would you use it to, what causes would you um, focus on to cure and solve? And everybody went around, they said the usual education, this, that, and the other thing. And then I flipped it back on her. I was like, well, what would you do? And she said, I would use the money to bribe the men and mainly men, but the people in power around the world um, to solve the most pressing problems in the world. Um, because, uh, and that's probably the only way you'd solve hunger because you like you, Jeff Bezos is not the government of India um, where he can, like India has a caste system, right? That like they believe that they're very poor, like, done something to deserve that. Um, and so like, your, your there's point things is that, that you be fighting against. There are problems that are so big, and this is a Bill Gates thing that I've heard him say, so this makes some sense to me as I'm learning about this. Like there are some problems that are so huge, you actually need something at the scale of government to solve them. Correct. And, and yet Gates talks about that. Like there are things that you just can't solve privately. Um, yes. So there's risks that governments and businesses, um, and that, that, that's the challenge, that you need the government to solve them and sometimes the private sector, but there are certain risks that those areas can't take. Like some ideas are too crazy. Um, for a government, if you're an elected official, you can't be betting on crazy new technologies that are very expensive because people will find out if they don't work, you lose, right? You don't win your next election. Um, the, a lot, some of these really good ideas, like let's call it solving hunger on like a local level, takes what they call patient capital, where it's like I have to build the infrastructure and the, the community and the, the, the businesses need to grow and the hospital needs to get better. And it's like this slower and you don't make your money back the way you would in a business and you don't have the results the way you'd want like a government. So that's where private philanthropy should come in, where they come in like, I'll put up the crazy risk. I can, I can fail as a private philanthropist um, because you can't, but if it works, then I want you to scale it. Um, Jacqueline Novogratz, we've had Mike, it's the sister, I believe of Mike Novogratz, who's been on this podcast, um, has started an organization called Acumen and her whole thing is about patient capital, like building a hospital that's not gonna have an ROI in the first five, 10, 20 years. But over time, that government can pick up the tab because it's starting, because the community's building and the, the profit models start to work and as a business or a government can start to come in. Um, so a long way of saying, uh, be like Bezos should be solving world hunger and helping us eat. He is donating, I believe, like giving 10 billion, he's the number one philanthropist in the world and so is his ex-wife. I don't see a future where he's not like pressured to give even more in that world. Um, but also, what, are you gonna, what is he gonna do? Like he's literally looking like, how do I give away 
$50 billion. If I wanted to give away $100 billion, how the hell do I do that? And what am I solving? You better do something awesome. Like that's a really hard challenge. I'm not be like, boo hoo, Jeff Bezos, wham, wham, wham. But seriously, it is very difficult. And if you listen to Bill and Melinda Gates talk about their foundation, they talk about how fucking impossible it is to give money away in an effective way that you would, the way you would invest it. Um, because these social problems are complicated. They are not black and white. They are not measured effectively. It's tough to measure and find results. Go ahead. So there's a concept in philanthropy. I I think it's philanthropy or in the world, right? That's like measure anything you're going to do with your money against just giving it to people. Obviously, that's a big thing you and I are advocates for. Why shouldn't he just, you know, figure out a way to do a massive UBI or hell, just like use his personal wealth to pay Amazon employees more and just use that money to just give it to other people. That's not a bad one. Um, we're talking about two and a half percent of it. So here's the other thing. Um, and I wrote this down. So I um, I don't think he's mutually, this isn't, um, what we're talking about is not mutually exclusive. Like him giving away two and a half percent of his wealth for the space race does not mean he can't give hundreds of billions of dollars to do a, a UBI or something crazy. Um, my concern, and if I was his advisor, like find something that's sustainable and not, you know, curing the symptom for a short period of time. But that's a different challenge. So the the big one for me, and like why space is actually, in my opinion, relatively philanthropic and has high philanthropic and has high ROI, is a couple of things. One, our government's not doing it. So if we are passionate as a human race about space exploration, billionaires have to step up. That's number one. Um, and philanthropies aren't doing it, and governments are seeing it's too risky, like it's too expensive and too risky, whatever it is. The second thing is it is massive upside here, both for profit and philanthropically. And I think that either we popularize space travel over time to the point where you could take a rocket from here to London and get there in, you know, from New York to London and get there in two hours or so, and that would change a whole bunch of ways we do business, or you start to colonize space. Um, Yeah, but isn't there a good argument to be made that says like, oh yay, now like, you know, the already rich people essentially who do global business can get to London a little bit faster, but isn't it better if we, again, give poor people money instead of being able to do that? That like that advancement is not actually great. It's not, it's not, it's a fair point, but it's like, I don't know, like how valuable is it that we can have planes going, like people can travel across the country so this, hours, I will say, states. okay. So and, and that's not just a rich people thing. Poor people, and like the average American is flying on a plane once a year, I imagine. Um, no, no. No? I don't think so. Absolutely not. Poor I Americans know. certainly are not. Once I a year? Poor the Americans. Sure. Like, we should look, look that up. But It is not just business people traveling. There are plenty of people that are you going were saying and use the You were saying going to London? Do you know how average Americans are not going on vacation? London's a bad example, but you could take a rocket anywhere when people okay. go. And maybe made here, it cheaper for people to go to Australia or go see a relative who's across the world. One of the coolest comparisons I heard was to maritime travel in the 1400s, which is... You know, in 1450, if you were going to take a ship from Spain, for example, to some other part of the world, which at that point we didn't even know really what existed because we hadn't fully traversed the globe, it was incredibly risky. It would have seemed like a terrible use of money because the odd that you sunk or just disappeared and never came back, et cetera, were very, very high. And yet what that exploration got us was like insurance for the first time. Like, you know, all sorts of things that in modern day we actually value that are good for any number of people. And of course, like we now live in a global world in ways that are largely very beneficial. I mean, there's obviously, you can come at me for like colonialism, et cetera. Um, And so one of the things that we know is being worked on as part of the space race is global broadband and being able to provide Mm -hmm. internet now from satellites to the entire world, including people in like third world countries who right now don't have any access or, you know, very little access to the internet and what that has the potential to do in terms of making a truly global marketplace, in terms of people suddenly earning money, you know, online in countries where, you know, whatever, $5 a day is, is incredible. Like there's a lot that can be done here in terms of bringing internet to the world. And you have things like Spacelink. I forget who's doing that. One of these, you know, billionaires or it might be, is, is working on Spacelink, (laughs) which does satellites to bring broadband, et cetera. So I think, um, that did shift my perspective a little bit of what's being underestimated on the part of people who are really opposed to this is 
how much innovation can come out of really important, valuable innovation can come out of investing in, in, in space. And what the point you're making, which I think is interesting, is that it should be private philanthropists doing this because the government should not be taking on this kind of risk, blowing this kind of money, but that we should be doing it. And so the people who should be doing it are exactly are this. Are the and if the government, and if, if Elon and Rick Branson and Jeff Bezos create recyclable rockets that cut the cost down going to space by 25 or 50 or 75 percent, and next thing you know, we can travel to Saturn, we're putting men on Mars. Eventually, if we have to back up the hard drive because of an extinction level event on Earth and we have to colonize Mars or the moon or God forbid any stuff, we'll be thanking them. And for two and a half percent of his net worth or whatever the heck, like for this, for a drop in the bucket for Jeff, this has high upside that no one else is really willing or able to take. So that is my defense of this. The big one to me, for those of you who are like, well, billionaires shouldn't exist this way, that sort of thing. To me, don't hate the player, hate the game. Like what Jeff Bezos is doing theoretically has massive upside for humanity. I don't think we should mad at him. Um, objectively, I'm not a human being. You can be mad at me. Okay, here's a question for you though. So a non gira Giridas, how do I pronounce his last name? Giridas, who wrote um, Winner Take All or whatever, which was a, a book that Yang loves. I know you love right. about about basically how you get these people who... I don't know, his last name. Sorry, I don't. Uh, yeah. You get super rich and then they give their money away a little bit and pat themselves on the back and feel like they've made a difference when really they haven't. So he wrote a book right. that makes that argument. He has said about this, and I'll, I'll shout out Griff Shark, I think was his name. Somebody, username, on our YouTube comments last time brought this to my attention, which I appreciate, um, which was Anand's argument that basically like America and what's great about America was built on this balance between what we do as a collective, what we do together, and then what we do alone. And that this whole billionaire space race is an example of this balance being totally out of whack. Um, I'm curious on your thoughts on that. One thing that comes to mind for me is in this maritime analogy I was making, uh, a lot of those you know, those ship explorations that happened in the 1400s were a combination of private investors and government investment, um, which, I, you know, helps ensure that there's a sort of collective benefit to be had from it. I don't know. What's your, any thoughts on that take? So I guess from my experience in talking to the big philanthropists, the issue is not what's getting done in some ways. I think there's times where government will have to make an investment no one wants to make and you like that, but other times philanthropists can do it too. So it's less about that. The big one to me, the biggest challenge of where philanthropy is going is oversight. And Bezos is not the best example because that is, um, or at least like Musk, like SpaceX, a public company. Um, like Blue, I don't, I don't think Blue Origin's public, but it's like there, there'll be some level of, of oversight there, I guess. And plus it's very public. But um, like they're making a big deal about it. But so there are a lot of philanthropists who wanted more flexibility than starting a private foundation or starting a nonprofit. So a private foundation, you have to give away. You basically give all the money at one point, you get your tax deduction there, and then you have to give away, I believe it's like 5% a year or so. There's like required distribution, maybe it's 10%, depends on. The, um, uh, it's been a while since I've been doing it, but at least 5%. Um, you have to give away a certain amount a year, but you don't have, the rest can just be invested. Um, but that has rules and regulations and the, the IRS and um, are, are actually closely monitoring private foundations. Those get audited a lot. Um, what Mark Zuckerberg, for example, did with his wife, they started, they didn't even do it for the tax purposes. They started an LLC, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, I think it's called. Um, the, their philanthropic efforts are all done in a for-profit vehicle, just do what they want which on one hand is really cool because they can take crazy risk and do what they want. They don't have to get 5% a year. They don't have to worry about uh, doing things that are uh, purely altruistic, whatever it is. But there's no public accountability because a nonprofit is technically owned by the public. So there's no awareness of who's on the board. Um, there's no direct oversight of what every dollar is spent on, so things like that. So that um, to me is the biggest challenge where it's, we're supposed to do this stuff together um, or some of these things affect all of us, but there's no government oversight on how it happens. That's the biggest challenge. Okay, well, I, I think this is interesting. I wanna uh, wrap us to our, our final topic here, bring us to our final topic here. Um, Don't hate the player, hate the game. Carly. Appreciate your take on this. 
you know, maybe people I, hate me. That's like just that's just so we need another. No, uh, I actually think you white bring guy a defending billionaires. Yeah. No, no, you bring a, a certain amount of knowledge to this that I think most people don't actually have. They don't understand how it works, and that's again, that's been a criticism I've heard of of the people who are criticizing the billionaires is that a lot of these folks are like commentators and haven't actually tried to like solve these problems in a big way and don't realize how hard it actually is and that this 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 space work is actually really valuable. And then it's I think critics, man, it's critics. But there's valid point. I mean, like Richard Branson tried to get a bunch of money from the UK government to bail out Virgin Atlantic in ways that like or Virgin Galactic or whatever that or I think it was Virgin Atlantic. Whatever. It just like it, it that riles me up because I'm like let capitalism do its thing. Let these companies fail. Also, you have $5.2 billion. Feel free to bail it out yourself if you're, like, <laughs> you know, so upset. Like, now you want government money? Like, that that does really get me. Oh, the fact that they don't pay income taxes. I got plenty of bones. Abs- yeah, and that's now the, si- that's the system, not necessarily the billionaire specifically, but it's, um, it's messed up. Okay. Speaking of money... Predict the future, Carly. Last Carly, topics. Do it. Well, no, I was going to say the, our, our final topic, I think, was going to be stoner cats, which is just yes. something we wanted yeah, to bring to people's future. attention. Future. Okay. So, uh, stoner cats. Like gift goats, which I talked about a while back. These NFTs always have silly You've names upgraded, that think. somehow involve animals. Um, stoner cats is an NFT project being launched really by Mila Kunis, I guess, but also with Ashton Kutcher. Fascinatingly, Vitalik Buterin is involved in this. Vitalik is the the founder of Ethereum, so that was cool that they got him. And uh, it is an NFT project that Jane was Fonda, supposed to drop. Chris Rock. Well, okay, we'll get there. So this, okay, okay. They're, they're not actually really behind the project though; they're just oh, actors. They're still so, involved. Okay, so let me give it to you. So Don't this NFT, NF- Zach, this NFT project was supposed to drop yesterday. As we're recording this, it's it's Tuesday, July twenty seventh when we record this. Um, it was supposed to drop yesterday, Monday, at 2 p.m. Pacific time. They had to push the launch back to today. Um, I'm going to give quick pros so and So we'll have launched already, by the way. So by the time this airs. Unless they push it back. This. Unless they push it back. Okay, I'm going to give you the quick pros and cons and the, and the rundown. The pros of this project is it's really cool and innovative. Basically, if you buy one of these NFTs, and they're going for like 0.35 ETH, which is like 800 bucks or whatever current prices of ETH, um, if you buy one of these, you it unlocks 45 minutes of content created by some like big wigs in Hollywood. So you have like the people who animated Spider-Man, who have you know a bunch of different like animators, people who created some cool TV shows, and then this content is voiced by the actors are Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, Seth MacFarlane, Jane Fonda, um, who's the one I missed you, Chris Rock, Chris Rock. and then Vitalik Buterin. Who am I missing? Vitalik Buterin who's the founder of Ethereum. And so it's like an all-star cast. It seems to be an all-star team creating this animated series called Stoner Cats. And then there are all sorts of other perks about cats who get high. Like what could go wrong? It's cats getting high. (laughs) (laughs) And there's all sorts of other benefits. If you become a token holder of this NFT, like you get you know additional perks and say in the content. And and the, the idea here is that this will hopefully fund other projects. So it's the first example that at least that I know of, of NFTs basically funding like a production company and putting the power in the hands of the viewers as opposed to in the hands of a traditional studio. Those are the pros. I think conceptually, super cool. I'm investing in it because I I love that concept. I want to see more of this. And hey, like call out to the socialism thing. This is what you're talking about. Like this is the worker collective. It's like the money is going to the people. Then I don't want to invest anymore. But oh my goodness, calm down. Okay, so and then the cons. What are the cons? This team has not done a fantastic job of building their community around this project. And right now in NFT world, it is very important to build a strong community for your NFT before it launches. Um, and I think there's been two failings on this, on this front. You have all of these celebrity mainstream players who are involved in this project, and they are doing very little to promote it or to educate their audiences on how to set up a MetaMask wallet, for example, and therefore to buy an NFT using ETH. Like they have not done the requisite education piece to draw in the mainstream audience. And they're also not letting you buy this with a credit card. It's like NBA Top Shot is is an NFT project that's done very well with the mainstream because you can use a credit card for it. Um, So they have not, they don't have the infrastructure for the mainstream and and then they have not, you know, 
educated the mainstream on how to buy ETH, which is a missed opportunity on a whole bunch of fronts. Seth MacFarlane isn't even tweeting about this, nor is Crash Rock, et cetera. So that means the people they're attracting are the like crypto NFT insiders who don't really give an F that these people are celebrities and just want like a cool, a cool project. Um, and on this front, they've sort of delivered because the project seems cool, but they haven't really like paid their respects to the inner community to make them feel comfortable and like they really know what they're doing. So they had to delay the launch yesterday because they messed up some of the tech. And instead of doing what some of these other projects have done when they have to delay their launch, because that's actually pretty common, and say, hey, okay, sorry, we're gonna have to delay, you know, we'll give you 24 hours notice before this thing drops. They sort of kept everybody on edge. They didn't give us a sense of like when the new ETA was. So people were getting really mad. They're like, this is disrespectful to the community. You're making us sit here and wait and waste our day um, instead of handling it the way you're supposed to. So the cons seem to be, they don't yet seem to be really good at navigating like the whole NFT crypto community. The pros are that I think it's innovative and super cool. And for that reason, I'm gonna put some ETH towards it. Um, but everyone should check it out. Stoner Cats, Stoner Cats TV, see what you think. We're investing, if we lose our shirt, I don't know. <laughs> and this is like, I can't We're tell- We're not investing Holly enough to lose our shirt. Don't invest so much that you're gonna lose your- true. I can't tell if we're just bitter that we missed on the gift goat. <laughs> um, and like Stoner Cat is our like consolation prize, or I'm kind of betting on the show being good because that I think will bring yes. a broader community. But the fact that these celebs have not tweeted about it makes me worry that it's not very good. Um, I don't think uh, that's it. I think they just don't want to have to educate. They don't want to start answering questions about like how do I get access to this show. I mean, look, true. clearly yeah, just, just, spending eight hundred dollars for forty five minutes of content is an absurd value proposition. That's like, ridiculous. <laughs> Of, of, of course. Well, you get other episodes, right? Or is it one you, one token per each, episode? No, no. Each episode is like five or six minutes. The episodes are really short. They have a total of 45 minutes of content for this first drop. But then the idea is that they're going to expand it to more content. And as a token holder, you have like say in what gets developed and you get, you know, other perks. Um, so there's a chance Carly's making me lose money again. Um, <laughs> again, Zach, we don't have to rehash money, this. I did not make you lose money the first time around. Stoner Cats. It's stonercats.com. You can just I don't Google think, is Stoner that what it is? Owner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's in Ashton Kutcher's uh, Instagram profile, too. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Ashton link, and Mila. Link in bio. Um, and by the way, Mila is sort of pro the billionaire space race. And, and watching an interview with her about Stoner Cats, she was like, I think people are misunderstanding the value of this whole space race thing. And she's like, I get the criticism, but I think it's people don't really understand. She talked about space race and stoner cats. She beat us yeah. to punch here. I thought this was the only podcast. Well, Ashton <laughs> was an investor in Virgin Galactic and Mila told him oh, he yeah. couldn't go to space. She was like, absolutely not. You're not going to space. I'm going to space, Carl. I'm doing it. Yeah, no, I would not um, be comfortable I'll with that. I would take the total play, Mila play. approach and was like, you, absolutely this is, not Zach. This, this is what's gonna happen. Stoner cats going to the moon and it's gonna pay for my Virgin Galactic quarter of a million dollar, moon. dollar space tourist ride. And I'm gonna be Wait, waitless. I'm gonna be waitless. So be there's amazing. a pun. It's Stoner Cats is gonna to go to the moon to fund your trip to the moon. I thought you were going like the cow jumped over the moon type poem thing. Uh, we are now burning the end of this podcast. Carl, Stoner Cats and Billionaire Space Race, an episode for what do we call this? For the record books. Um, great to have you. Thank you for keeping great me. Great to, I'm a co-host now, Zach. Always. Great <laughs> to have you, Zach. It's great to have you. I'm glad to be in your presence. We're out. Have a good week, everybody. <laughs> See you next Thursday. Bye, everyone. <laughs>